So next speaker is Sarah Harrison talking about the spectrum on M04 via Liu wheel theory. Please. All right. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to speak and to all of you for showing up uh, virtually for my talk. Um, today I'd like to tell you about some work in progress that I'm doing with two of my colleagues at McGill, Alex Maloney, um, a professor there, and a postdoc, Tokiro Numasawa, who uh, will be leaving us in a few months to go to MIT. So, Today, I'd like to talk about the following very specific uh, question, um, which can be mathematically stated as, uh, what is the spectrum of the Ve peterson laplacian on M04, uh, which is the moduli space of genus zero Riemann surfaces with four punctures? And before I tell you a bit more uh, what this question means and how we're gonna approach it, I'd like to start with some general broad uh, motivation about why we're interested in this kind of question, asking this kind of question. Um, and so from both, uh, uh, if you're both a physicist or a mathematician, um, there's a lot of interesting structure in understanding dynamics uh, on moduli spaces. Um, for example, just a few uh, examples I thought of in physics, uh, moduli spaces appear in string theory, uh, for example, in low dimensional compactifications where the ground state is a wave function on moduli space, as well as a number of uh, special BPS solutions and supersymmetric theories. Um, and more generally in mathematics, spectral theory on manifolds is a very fascinating and intricate subject with connections to a variety of fields. Um, so one such uh, specific example of the kind of connections between, um, between fields that exists is a relation via a formula called the Selberg trace formula between eigenvalues of the Laplacian uh, on a Riemann surface and the lengths of geodesics. Um, and this is a very uh, specific example of a more general phenomenon which has applications to geometry of various types, hyperbolic geometry, arithmetic geometry, as well as uh, special functions uh, in number theory and uh, quantum chaos. Um, so we're interested in exploring um, some of these types of connections on the more complicated manifolds, that is, uh, manifolds which are moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. Um, and specifically in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about our, uh, our work using techniques from Liouville theory uh, to study the geometry of moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. So Liouville theory is a very interesting quantum field theory. It's conformal, uh, it's irrational, uh, and it's been studied for uh, several decades by a very, very long list of people. And I've listed um, just some of them here. Uh, I'm sorry if I forgot, uh, forgot to list you, but um, a lot of people have done a, a great amount of important work on this theory. Um, and it's interesting for us um, specifically because it has a deep connection to the geometry of Riemann surfaces. Uh, for example, in physics, if you want to quantize uh, gravity in two or three dimensions, um, they involve integrating over moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces uh, if you're in 2D, or quantizing the geometry of Riemann surfaces uh, in three dimensions. Uh, and so Louisville theory is relevant uh, for low dimensional quantum gravity from its connection to the geometry of Riemann surfaces. Um, and finally, another um, uh, set of work that people have done, which has motivated us, is recent work relating quantum gravity uh, to ideas in quantum chaos. Perhaps the recent um, uh, interest in this started with a paper of Maldesena, Schenker, and Sanford, but there are many other papers um, involving the study of, of specific uh, systems in holography or, um, or quantum black holes and connections uh, to the physics of chaos. And in some of these uh, systems, moduli spaces play a special role. So I'll just mention two examples. One has to do with uh, with work done by Saad, Schenker, and Stanford, where they computed uh, the path integral of jakiv teinoboim gravity, which is a two-dimensional theory of quantum gravity, um, and which involves integrating over moduli spaces of bordered Riemann surfaces. 
Um, in order to show that this theory is dual to a random ensemble of quantum mechanical systems, as well as very recent work um, in explorations over uh, averaging over moduli spaces of 2D CFTs uh, to, um, to draw a connection to gravity in ADS-3. And these, uh, these kind of cases are um, of note because their spectra are known to be chaotic. So we're not going to do anything um, so specifically connected with quantum gravity today, uh, though we are motivated by the connections between quantum gravity and chaos. But we're going to kind of consider a toy model uh, and ask the question is, uh, which is, can we see physics of chaotic systems by studying the motion of a quantum mechanical particle moving on M04, this moduli space of Riemann surfaces with four functions? OK. So that's a kind of a summary of our uh, general motivation from a variety of, of directions. And here's the plan for the rest of my talk. So first I'll give a brief review of Liouville theory uh, and its connection to the geometry of Riemann surfaces. So this is a, a very detailed uh, subject and I'll just give sort of uh, the basics of, of the results of this connection. Uh, and then I'll present um, the main object that we're going to use to study the spectrum on this moduli space, which is the uh, a natural metric which you uh, can define, known as the Vey-Peterson metric. Um, and then in the main and maybe most interesting part, I'll present our pre preliminary results on computing the spectrum of this met metric. We're not going to do it exactly or analytically at all. We're going to use uh, numerical techniques. Um, uh, using a, an approximate form of the metric. Uh, but nevertheless, I'll be able to show you some results about eigenfunctions and eigenvalues uh, of our approximation to the metric. And finally, I'll end with um, some extensions we would like to, to work on and open questions. Okay. So uh, because our technique is going to be uh, coming from two-dimensional CFT and Liouville theory, uh, I'll just start with a review of Liouville theory. So it's a, a 2D uh, quantum field theory uh, with, which has the following action of a single uh, scalar field with this potential, this exponential potential. Um, and it's actually a conformal field theory where the central charge is commonly uh, parameterized by a variable Q um, such that you can write it as 1 plus 6q squared, um, where q is this uh, b appearing in the exponential plus 1 over b. And this conformal field theory has a continuous spectrum. So it's kind of interesting in, in, the, um, in comparison to other conformal field theories, which we can uh, solve um, to a high degree, such as the rational conformal field theories, uh, which have discrete spectrum. Liouville theory is, is notable because we know so much about uh, its correlation functions, um, and, but it's uh, kind of the canonical example of an irrational CFT that we can study. Um, the primary operators are uh, in the theory are vertex operators, uh, which have a conformal dimension, which is related to this charge, Q, uh, in the following way. So the dimension, if you write the dimension uh, delta as alpha times Q minus alpha, and let alpha be Q over 2 plus IP, uh, that tells you the dimension of the primary operator. And P is a variable that's commonly referred to as the Liouville momentum. Uh, and the full quantum theory theory can be characterized by the set of endpoint correlation functions of these primary operators. And we know a lot about um, uh, how to compute these uh, correlation functions and their symmetries in the theory. Um, so there's a beautiful connection between the quantum Liouville theory and the geometry of Riemann surfaces. And I'll start by describing the connection in the semi-classical limit when you say, take the central charge to infinity or alternatively this uh, B variable to zero. So in this limit, um, if you appropriately rescaled the, the Liouville field phi, uh, it obeys the classical equation of motion uh, which I have written at the center of the slide, that's known as Liouville's equation. And this equation was studied by mathematicians as far back as uh, Poincaré, I think, um, who 
showed that a solution to this equation on a Riemann surface with uh, certain uh, boundary conditions at, uh, at a number of punctures on the surface furnishes a unique constant negative curvature metric on the Riemann surface, uh, where the metric takes the form uh, ds squared equals e to the phi dz squared, where z is a complex coordinate on sigma. Um, and you can have different boundary conditions at these uh, points on the Riemann surface if you choose different dimensions of the primary operators in Liouville theory. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about punctured uh, Riemann surfaces. And in Liouville theory, punctures correspond to primary operators with Liouville momentum uh, set to zero. But you could also consider cone points or uh, holes with geodesic boundaries, which correspond to a different choice of Liouville momentum for the primary operators. So this is a connection to classical hyperbolic geometry of Riemann surfaces, um, coming from the semi-classical uh, limit of, of Liouville theory. But you can also move away from the semi-classical limit and study the quantum theory, and this should tell us something about uh, so-called quantum geometry of Riemann surfaces. Uh, which is also a very interesting subject, um, which I won't say much about today. So today we're going to focus on kind of the simplest case for us to study, though we may eventually like to study um, um, different, more general moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces. But today we're just going to focus on genus zero Riemann surfaces with four punctures. Um, and so I'd like to review a bit uh, about the geometry of the moduli space M04 of these Riemann surfaces. So there are many kinds of ways to parameterize the moduli space um, of, of M04, but I'm going to focus on a, a specific one which will be useful for the computations that we want to do. So, um, so let me describe the moduli space M04 um, by a single complex coordinate um, x, which uh, is the cross ratio coordinate, um, defined in terms of the locations of the four punctures by this uh, equation z1 minus z2 times z3 minus z4 over z1 minus z4 times z2 minus z3. So this will specify a point in moduli space up to um, conformal transformations which preserve this uh, cross ratio coordinate. So once we specify a, a value of x, we specify a particular Riemann surface, which uh, labels a point in M04. So here I have a picture of, of a typical Riemann surface, sigma 04, in the moduli space, the locations of these four punctures. Um, and um, here I, I also have drawn on the picture this, um, this circle, which um, I'll which is a geodesic on this Riemann surface. Um, in this is the, with some length, which I'm labeling L sub S. This is um, a minimal geodesic in the S channel um, of, of, the, um, of the Liouville theory on this Riemann surface. Uh, and it's, it's um, also common to parameterize the moduli space by coordinates, um, which are given by the length of this geodesic and some twist coordinate around, um, uh, around this geodesic boundary that uh, you specify when you glue two pairs of pants together to form this Riemann surface. These are known as fenchel nielsen coordinates, but we're not going to, to use those uh, today because it turns out to be much more difficult um, to use our methods to compute the metric in those coordinates. So, um, so I just want to show you, uh, discuss a bit more about the cross ratio coordinates on moduli space. So if we define the cross ratio in the following way, um, it takes values in the complex X plane. Um, and there are a number of symmetries of the moduli space. Uh, these symmetries act on the cross ratio coordinate by anharmonic transformations. And the generator of this group uh, the generators of this group are given by uh, taking x to 1 minus x and x to 1 over x. And here on the left side, I plotted the cross ratio coordinate, the, the complex plane, and half of the fundamental domain 
uh, for these anharmonic transformations acting on the cross ratio coordinate. So the whole fundamental domain um, is the area where you take the shaded region and also reflect it across the red line. Um, but I only, I'm plotting half the fundamental domain because it turns out that we're going to solve the Laplace's equation on only half the fundamental domain uh, using the fact that there's a symmetry uh, about this red line of the moduli space. And it turns out we'll also find it convenient to use a, a different coordinate, tau, which we can define in terms of the cross ratio coordinate as i times this ratio of elliptic integrals uh, of x. Um, so now tau takes uh, values in the upper half plane. Um, and in fact, uh, the moduli space uh, m04 um, is, is just a, a piece of the upper half plane of the tau coordinate. So the tau coordinate um, is a multiple clever of m04. And the fundamental domain for the, uh, the group of uh, anharmonic transformations on x in the tau coordinate is plotted in the shaded region here. Um, so these anharmonic transformations become modular transformations of the tau coordinate for some modular subgroup of SL2Z. So one reason why we'll find the tau coordinate useful is that things like conformal blocks, which are multi-valued in the, in the cross ratio coordinate, are single valued in tau. OK. So now I'd like to talk about the metric on moduli space, which we want to study. So there's a natural symplectic structure on M04, which I'll call uh, omega Bay peterson um, and it turns out this also arises naturally in physics in a number of ways. For example, as I mentioned earlier, the 2D um, uh, path integral of JT gravity, um, as well as uh, quantizing S SL2C, turns Simon's theory, um, on a Riemann surface. Um, and this uh, symplectic structure leads to a Kähler metric of the moduli space known as the Ve peterson metric. And this is the metric for which we want to study Laplace's equation on M04. So there's a theorem due to Zograph and Taktajan that the Liouville action is a Kähler potential for the Ve peterson metric. Uh, so um, in general, um, we can't compute this metric exactly, but because of this relation to the action of Liouville theory, we can use techniques developed from Liouville CFT to get a very accurate approximation to the Bay Peterson metric, which is what I'm going to uh, discuss. So um, first we have to discuss uh, how we can compute this uh, action of Liouville theory um, in order to derive the metric. So um, since we're studying Riemann surfaces with four punctures, um, we have to analyze the path integral on a, on a Riemann surface with four punctures, which can be expressed as a four-point function of primary operators in the theory uh, in the following way. So um, I put the four primary operators at the points 0, 1, x, uh, and infinity. And this four-point function is given by an uh, integral over um, operators of some internal dimension uh, delta times some three-point coefficients and a conformal block, which depends on uh, delta, the, the dimensions of the external operators, and the cross ratio. Uh, and in this expression, I've set the deltas of the external operators all to c minus 1 over 24, which corresponds um, to uh, the fact that we're studying punctures at the four locations of the external operators. So we're going to study um, this uh, four-point function in the semi-classical limit when we take c to infinity or the value q squared to infinity. And in this limit, the path integral behaves as a, an exponential to the minus q squared times the classical action. Um, and the classical action has an expression in terms of a, a three-point function action between two external operators and an internal uh, operator. Um, minus some uh, cl so-called classical conformal block, which comes from the fact that the capital F, the full conformal block, uh, exponentiates in the semi-classical limit. 
So um, in the classical limit, since uh, Q squared is going to uh, infinity, it's convenient to rescale the dimensions uh, of the operators we're working with uh, by a factor of one over Q squared. So I'm gonna write these expressions in terms of a new dimension that I define as little delta, which is the original uh, capital delta divided by Q squared. And in the case of punctures, um, this little delta becomes one fourth. So the dimensions of the four external operators will have little delta one fourth, and then the internal one um, will have uh, dimension one fourth plus P squared. So uh, in the semi-classical limit, the path integral will be dominated by a saddle point at some particular value of this internal dimension, uh, little delta sub S, uh, which I'm parameterizing as one fourth plus P sub S squared. Uh, and this dimension is determined by the saddle point equation, which is just uh, setting the derivative of uh, the classical action with respect to P uh, to zero. Um, and this uh, value of an uh, internal momentum, saddle point momentum P sub S has the physical meaning uh, as the length of the minimal geodesic in the S channel. Uh, which is the, uh, the geodesic I drew on a picture of floor a few slides ago. So the length of this geodesic is uh, related to P sub S by uh, uh, L sub S equals four pi P sub S. So our method for studying the metric is to use a, a semi-classical expansion around the saddle point to approximate the Bay peterson metric. So I'm gonna show you how this works uh, first near the boundary of moduli space uh, in the cross ratio coordinate. So there's a boundary of moduli space when you take the cross ratio X to zero, which is like uh, taking the point Z1 and Z2 very close together or Z3 and Z4 equivalently. Um, and in this case, the minimal geodesic um, just goes towards this boundary. So the length of the minimal geodesic uh, goes to zero because you're bringing two points on one on side of it to zero. So this uh, internal saddle point momentum uh, goes to zero. So we can expand the classical action around both uh, x equals zero and p equals zero. Uh, so there were two, as I showed on the last side, there are two contributions to the action. There's a three-point function contribution and the classical conformal block contribution. And here you see the expansion of both of them near uh, x and p equals zero. Um, so just expanding to uh, order p squared uh, in both of these expressions and plugging them back into the uh, formula for the classical action, uh, we can derive the saddle point equation um, by taking the derivative uh, of these expressions. And you see uh, that it takes the following form. Um, and this uh, equation has a solution given by a uh, piece of S going like pi over minus log X X bar plus 16 log two. So this is the solution for the um, saddle point momentum near the, this boundary of moduli space. And now if we want to get the metric near the boundary, uh, we just plug in the solution uh, for a piece of S and evaluate the action as a function of the cross ratio coordinate. Uh, and then we take to two derivatives of it to get the metric. Uh, and we find that the metric near the boundary moduli space takes the following form. It goes like eight pi squared over X X bar log cubed of two to the 16th over X X bar. And this computation actually uh, matches a computation by Wolpert for the uh, bay peterson metric near the boundary and moduli space. Okay, so things like the conformal block uh, expansion in the cross ratio coordinate um, only have a radius of convergence of one. Uh, so this isn't gonna be good enough for us if we wanna analyze the spectrum of the Laplace unit on M04, we'd like to do uh, much better to get some kind of accurate comp computation of eigenvalues. So instead of uh, analyzing the saddle point equation in the x-coordinate, we're going to use uh, a much better approximation by working in a new variable called q of x, um, which is defined as e to the pi i tau, where tau is this uh, ratio of uh, elliptic integrals of x that I presented earlier. So um, 
the idea to use uh, this coordinate um, was promoted by Zamolodzikov when he was discussing uh, discussing solution or computation of uh, conformal blocks uh, in Louisville theory. Um, so conformal blocks uh, converge extremely rapidly in this Q variable. Q takes values in the unit disk and they converge and it converges uh, everywhere except for uh, small uh, neighborhoods of the bound around the boundaries of moduli space. So instead, we'll um, analyze the saddle point equation in the Q variable. Uh, and uh, a method of doing this is we can define an expansion parameter, which I'll call epsilon, um, as pi over this uh, log of this ratio 2 to the eighth over Q, Q bar, which happens uh, to appear um, all the time in the same, same form, uh, such that the saddle point equation um, becomes the following. Um, it goes like minus 2 pi plus 2 p pi over epsilon plus a sum uh, uh, power series and uh, powers of p plus uh, uh, expansion coming from the q expansion of the conformal block. So the terms that I've underlined in blue, they both come from the expansion of the three-point function. Um, in principle, these coefficients, they're uh, a sub n, they're known. Uh, they come from Taylor expanding some product and ratio of gamma functions. Um, so we can compute them up to any order we'd like. Um, and this order q part, uh, which comes from the q expansion of the conformal block, uh, we can compute it uh, via recursion relations due to Zamolodzikov also up to any order that we'd like. So expanding the uh, saddle point equation in this way, um, we can make an ansatz for the saddle point momentum, which is some power series in epsilon, and solve this recursively um, in order to get a solution for P sub s. So here are some expressions for, um, for, for the approximation to the metric uh, at different orders in this epsilon and Q expansion. So for example, if we only take the leading order in the conformal block expansion and expand up, up to epsilon to the eighth order, the metric has the following form on this uh, top line uh, in the epsilon expansion. Um, and if we take leading, we can get corrections to this by expanding the conformal block to higher orders and powers of Q. Uh, so, uh, the expression is simplest if I only keep leading order in epsilon um, and order Q squared in the conformal block expansion, it takes the following form uh, about in the, the second expression. So using this technique and enough time, computing time to expand uh, to the conformal blocks to uh, high, high, as high order as we'd like, we can approximate the metric up to uh, our desired accuracy. And again, um, the power of this method is the fact that the um, expansion in, in the Q variable is rapidly convergent uh, almost everywhere in the unit disk. So this is the method that we use to compute the metric um, in this dual epsilon and Q expansion. And now we'd like to check how accurate our computations are uh, at a given order in this expansion. Um, and so there are multiple kinds of checks we can do. Um, so I'm showing you here um, our numerical computations compared with exact results for two quantities. First of all, um, the volume of the moduli space, which was shown in the third column, as well as the geodesic lengths um, at certain values of the cross ratio, which are known analytically. Um, so in the first two columns, um, I've computed the, or I show you the computation of the, the cosh of uh, one over the geodesic length at value, cross ratio values x equals one half and x equals e to the pi i over three. These um, values are known exactly to be three and seven halves. And then I show you um, our numerical computation uh, uh, of this quantity um, at a number of different orders in the epsilon expansion, keeping only up 
to order Q squared in the conformal block expansion. And you see that it, it already gets to be pretty accurate, like um, up to 0.1% by epsilon to the, the seventh. But if you go extremely high, like epsilon to the 60, it becomes extremely accurate. Um, and on the, in the final column, um, I compute, we compute the volume of the moduli space uh, given our metric. Um, this volume is known exactly to be two pi, equal to 2 pi squared, which is approximately 19.7392088. Uh, and you see the numerical computation of the volume given our metric. And by the time we get to epsilon to the 60, it's accurate up to four decimal points. So this gives us some confidence about um, how accurate we expect our, met our metric to be um, once we start computing things that we don't already know the answer to, like the spectrum of the Laplacian. Okay, so in, in this uh, final part of the talk, I'd like to present some results that we have, preliminary results we have um, for solving Laplace's equation using our expansion of the metric. So, um, so using our approximation in this epsilon and Q expansion, it's easy to write down Laplace's equation. And what I'm gonna show you are results for the solution of this equation on the half fundamental domain. So the shaded region that I presented earlier in the tau plane, where we're gonna impose Dirichlet boundary conditions on the boundary of this region. And this will capture the, um, uh, totally anti-symmetric sector of solutions to this equation. There are also other solutions that you would get um, um, by Im imposing other boundary conditions. But these are the simplest uh, to solve. So we started with this case. Uh, and the way we solve it is using uh, Mathematica's ND Eigen system function, um, which basically discretizes the fundamental domain with some, some mesh size. Um, and numerically solves this equation. Um, and another check on our results is we'd like to see that um, if we get to a suitably small discretization size and then change it uh, to be even smaller, that our eigenvalues are uh, roughly stable. And we find that um, the first eigenvalues were stable up to 0.01% when we uh, decreased our mesh size. Okay, so what we can do is we numerically solve this equation. We can find the, the eigenvalues, which I'll present in a moment, as well as the eigenfunctions. So it's kind of cool to look at a visual, visualization of some of the eigenfunctions in the tau plane. Um, and here I show you just uh, some pictures from our numerical results of the, these eigenfunctions. The ground state on the left, the, uh, I believe, fifth excited state and 40th excited state here. Okay, so we also would like to study the statistics of the energy eigenvalues uh, of the Laplacian, and uh, one way we can uh, uh, we can me measure this is by looking at something called the which I'll call the adjacent gap ratio, um, which is defined as the difference between the nth and n plus first energy eigenvalue divided by the difference between the nth and n minus, minus first eigenvalue. And so on the left, I've plotted a histogram of uh, this distribution uh, for about the first 100 eigenvalues uh, of the Laplacian and compared it to some uh, prob probability distributions which arise from some known ensembles. So. Uh, the purple, red, and blue lines are from, from three different random matrix en ensembles, and the gray line is coming from just a Poisson distribution if the eigenvalues were totally independent from each other. Um, so uh, I'm not sure this, this plot says anything very conclusive about which random matrix ensemble these uh, eigenvalues might come from, but it does seem to show that they're certainly not Poisson. Uh, and on the right side, hand side, I have a plot of the average of this adjacent uh, gap ratio as a function of the first n energy levels, um, where the energy level is plotted on the, the x-axis and on the y-axis is 
the average for the first, first n of them, uh, as well as, again, a comparison to some known distributions. Uh, and it looks like the average is maybe approaching uh, uh, what you would expect from a uh, random matrix in the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So I, I don't want to say anything definitive about this. Uh, a second thing we can uh, we can compute once we have a spectrum of energy eigenvalues is something known as the spectrum form fact factor, which probes the nature of uh, of the spectrum. Uh, in particular, it probes it can probe whether the spectrum uh, is characteristic of say a chaotic system versus an uh, integrable system. So the spectral form factor is basically just, uh, just the magnitude of the partition function squared. Um, and on the left-hand side, I plotted the spectral form factor as a function of t on a log-log plot. Um, and uh, for those familiar with the terminology, this seems to show a characteristic dip, ramp, and plateau, which was uh, maybe first given the names uh, a few years ago in a, in a work by uh, a large number of authors on black holes and random matrices um, who, who, um, who studied the spectral form factor in, in random matrix theories and, uh, with, and showed that it has this uh, typical pattern in, in the case of uh, chaotic eigenvalues. And on the right-hand side, I uh, plot a linear plot of the spectral form factor. Um, and we see that there's approximately a linear growth in this, uh, in this region that I've fit with a red line, uh, which is characteristic of eigenvalue repulsion in a spectrum. So again, um, these, the results uh, from these plots, they contain the first uh, about 100 eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Uh, computed numerically uh, with a conformal block expansion, but only up to order Q squared. Um, okay, so those are all the preliminary results that I'd like to show you. So I'd just like to ex uh, end with some, um, some uh, extensions and open questions that we'd like to explore. So the, the, the main summary is the is the following. You've initiated a study of chaos on moduli space, which is in fact quite an old subject and a very rich field in mathematics. But I think what we are adding here is uh, the idea of using techniques from physics and conformal field theory, particularly Louisville theory in the case that we're looking at to, uh, to study this problem. Um, and there are a number of directions that we can investigate further. For example, uh, on M04 particularly, we could try and study the spectrum of uh, geodesic lengths and perhaps verify something known as a Gutzweiler trace formula, which relates the density of states um, in a quantum system to classical periodic orbits. Uh, we can also try extending uh, what moduli spaces we're looking at. And the simplest way seems like instead of considering punctures to look at something like cone points and more complicated than cone points would be uh, geodesic boundaries, or generalized to other moduli spaces, such as uh, a torus with one hole or MGN in general. So the motivation for studying, um, studying a moduli space with one boundary is that, um, well, one piece of motivation is that you can imagine um, that uh, in ADS3 gravity, um, there are a class of solutions known as BTZ black holes, and you can imagine that there are uh, solutions for BTZ black holes where there is some interesting geometry behind the horizon, such as a Riemann surface uh, with one boundary, um, and use the quantization of the moduli space of this Riemann surface as a model for uh, the microstates of a BTZ black hole. So there's a paper written about this by my collaborator, Alex Maloney. But more generally, um, we're just interested generally in the problem of quantizing gravity on the general moduli spaces of Riemann surfaces and understanding connections with quantum chaos. So that's all I want to tell you today. Thanks very much uh, for listening.
Thank you very much for this excellent talk. So let me unmute everybody so we can thank you all together. Okay. Um, let's. Uh, okay. Are there questions? Yeah. First of all, from Sergey Gugov, please. I will unmute you. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for a very nice talk. I have um, two questions. One is um, certain aspects of the moduli space M04 are related to Penleve S6 equation. So one question is if there is a connection to tau function of Penleve S6. And second question is if there is any connection to physics of SU2 gauge theory with four fundamentals in four dimensions for the n equals two theory. Sarah, you muted? Yeah, no, I doesn't seem to be muted. Sarah? Oh, some, sorry, somehow I, I think I accidentally muted myself. <laughs> um, I, I think the answer to both is I don't really know. Um, the, for the second one, why are, you, why are you asking about the question connection to, sorry, what did you say, SU2 with four, four fundamentals? Uh, oh, yeah, if we think about uh, class S type construction uh, mm, I, I on see. this uh, yeah. Riemann surface, we naturally get 4D and SU2 theory with four fundamental flavor. I see, I see. And tau parameter is tau of free potential in cyber Clifton solution and necrosis mm -hmm. partition function. So that's the reason for the second question. I see. Um, yeah, we, we, haven't, we haven't thought about that at all. So I, I don't know. Um, um, I guess you could think of our, um, um, our eigenfunctions as wave functions on the moduli space, but we're with a very specific Hamiltonian, which is the Laplacian. Um, and I'm not sure of a physical, like a physical system where we can embed um that set up uh into into something like what you're discussing so are you happy with the answer do you want to say more <laughs> <laughs> okay so maybe we can move to the next question by shirai shirai so let me unmute you. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sherry, uh, just. Sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I just had a, uh, uh, well, uh, so do you know what is the curvature of this metric that you're defining? If it is constant everywhere, or if, even if it is not constant, is it negative everywhere? It's uh, the metric on the moduli space. The Weyl-Peterson metric. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a uh, constant, but I haven't computed the, the curvature. I suppose we could, um, but again, yeah, we won't be able to compute it exactly because we don't have an exact expression for it. Okay. So, uh, the reason why I was uh, asking this is, uh, the following in the standard case or in the classical case. Uh, when you look at the Laplacian coming from the hyperbolic metric, which you know is constant mm -hmm. and curvature one, in that case, uh, there are, uh, well, there was a conjecture of quantum unique ergodicity. Uh, so mm -hmm. you've already mentioned quantum chaos, but there's a slight uh, generalization of that to quantum unique ergodicity, and it was very important in mathematics, and the person who solved it got the Fields Medal as well. So uh, the first, well, I was just wondering. So to um, to formulate a quantum unique ergodicity, you need your metric to have a negative curvature everywhere, not constant, but just negative curvature everywhere. 
So if uh, the whale peterson metric uh, does have negative curvature everywhere, that it would be um, a natural question to uh, ask if uh, uh, the Laplacian actually satis well, the Laplacian with the whale peterson metric actually satisfies a quantum unique ergodicity or not. I see. Um, second is, uh, so I'll just ask uh, uh, quickly. Uh, again, in the classical case, the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian are uh, very special functions. They're called uh, mass forms. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're very important in automorphic theory. So have you looked at the automorphic theory of uh, eigenfunctions of uh, your Laplacian? Well, not your Laplacian, but the whale peterson Laplacian. Uh, yeah, I mean, the reason that would be great, but... Um... <laughs> So I don't me, think the reason why I asked I, this the picture that you showed of the functions mm -hmm. uh, I don't I tried to copy down the slide number but there were no slide numbers but you had a I think nice, they'll be posted eventually the slides okay so, so you yeah. had a really nice picture of uh, the eigen functions and they look I mean this is obviously very in the uh, up wavy they look uh, very much like uh, um, uh, graphs for uh, mass forms especially mm -hmm. something called the nodal sets of mass form. So I believe these functions would have uh, very nice automorphic properties. As mm -hmm. well. Yeah, that'd be fascinating to study. Right now, we just have numerical solutions for them. So um, at this point, I think the most we could do with respect to automorphic properties is some kind of numerical analysis. But um, you can imagine trying to study that given the sort of expansion expansion of the metric in some yeah. kind of analytic way but it might i mean it, i imagine it it might not be very uh obvious uh yeah. in the kind of form that we're able to work with um but i would imagine it's something more complicated than moss forms <laughs> um because the metric is way more complicated than just uh, like a hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane. I mean, the, the, which would mean they're more interesting as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's a, yeah, that's a great um, point. No problem. Thank you. Uh, there's another point, uh, but I think I, I can ask that later in the breakout and other people should get a chance. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so let's move to the next question by Richard Cariberi. I will unmute you. Please. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. I was, I was just wondering whether you had an explicit bound on the error for your approximations of the Bay Peterson metric. Um, we haven't tried to compute anything like that yet, um, mathematically. Um, but that's a good, good question to look into. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, we just kind of have this uh, preliminary, uh, um, yeah, these preliminary results for, I mean, we have this method of expansion, but we haven't analyzed like the, the error of these quantities. Okay, but are you, cool, okay, cool. It's, yeah, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 that's fine, that's fine. It was, it was, it was a lovely table of, uh, of, of known results versus approximations, but I was like, oh, but how do we know? But, uh, yeah, yeah. But cool, cool. No, that was yeah. nice talk. Thank you. Any other question? I don't see any other question. Okay, so I think uh, we can uh, stop the session for today. Let me thank once again uh, Yangui and uh, Sarah for their excellent talks. And uh, people now may want to move to the discussion session and we will reconvene tomorrow for uh, the next uh, set of, of talks. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I am currently assigning um, people to uh, breakaway sessions. There will be two sessions as usual, for uh, two rooms, one for session one, the first three speakers, and one for uh, session two. Um, if you, the speakers are automatically put into their respective um, rooms, but if you have a particular preference, please do send me a, um, please do send me a private message. Um, 
uh, and I will open the rooms uh, at um, 7 p.m. local time, and I'll leave them open for an hour um, before which we'll close the, uh, after which we'll close the, the session for the day. So if you send me your preference, I can assign you now. <laughs>